On 15th August, an Allied fleet of more than 800 ships assembles for the invasion of southern France. This new threat to Germany's battered European defenses occurs a little more than two months after the Normandy invasion. From Washington comes Secretary of the Navy James V. Forrestal to discuss invasion plans with the Naval Command and to observe operations firsthand. The convoy gets underway, heading toward beaches between Toulon and Cannes. The Armada came from Italy, North Africa, Corsica, and Sardinia. Included in the personnel were veterans of previous campaigns in the Mediterranean theater. Air Corps, Navy, Coast Guard, and Signal Corps cameramen covered operations. Last minute preparations. Thousands of airborne troops take off in glider planes. Their mission, to drop behind German coastal fortifications and secure important road junctions and bridges. Landing behind Nazi defenses on the Riviera. Thousands of paratroopers flown to the Riviera by C-47s also take part in pre-amphibious operations on Nazi rear line communications. Landing in the Argent River Valley near Lemuy. As paratroopers spread out toward their objectives, they establish contact with French forces of the interior, whose support has figured extensively in the Battle of France. Briefing members of the 451st Bombing Group detailed to neutralize coastal defenses and destroy communication lines 
prior to amphibious landings. Medium and heavy bombers take off at dawn, bringing to a climax many weeks of air preparation deep into the interior of southern France. Fighter planes strafe ground targets. Shelling the Riviera coast. Taking part in this operation were United States, British, and French vessels, as well as ships of the Netherlands, Poland, Greece, and Belgium. The landings begin at 0800 hours, supported by covering fire from battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. Three divisions, accompanied by French troops, made the original assault the 3rd, 36th, and 45th. Company, 141st Infantry, 35th Division, meet heavy opposition as they hit the beach east of San Rafael. advancing inland against slight opposition. Back at the beaches, reinforcements and equipment are ready to be landed.
an abandoned, incompleted German pillbox. A camouflaged Nazi gun emplacement. One of our landing craft hit by a radio-controlled flying bomb from a German Dornier. Most of the personnel escaped. Landing heavy equipment as the original beachhead expands east and west. Engineers construct an airstrip through a vineyard. The runway will be 150 by 3,000 feet. By D plus one, the invaders held a coastal strip 40 miles long, 20 miles deep. Natives of liberated Normandy towns rapidly returned to normalcy. At Bayeux, the Civil Affairs Committee has arranged for the return of radio sets to the townspeople. The radios were confiscated by the Nazis four years ago. During that period, the only contact these Frenchmen had with the outside world was through the underground. As these natives of a typical small French town enjoy the restoration of legal rights and possessions, elsewhere the battle continues to extend the breakthrough at the base of the Cotentin Peninsula. American forces resting in Pont du Beau, 3rd August. The breakthrough in the Cotentin Peninsula provided a corridor for the movement of troops and supplies, not only for drives into the Breton Peninsula, but also for the advance toward Paris. Troops occupy St. James, widening the narrow corridor leading into Brittany. capital and communication center of Brittany falls to General George S. Patton's forces 4th August. American paratroopers captured by the Nazis on D-Day freed after two months imprisonment. Liberation ceremonies conducted by the mayor of Rennes. French patriots round up collaborationists. A German ordnance depot just outside the city of Rennes. The speed of the Allied advance forced retreating Nazis to abandon substantial quantities of equipment. A 
advancing toward Chéron's Lourcelles in spite of Nazi attempts to close the narrow corridor at the base of the Cotentin Peninsula and stop the movement of Allied forces into Brittany. Another American armored column, after driving southeastward from pont a reaches the outskirts of Mayenne, rail and road junction leading toward Paris. Entering Mayenne, 6th August. Troops moving eastward along a 40-mile front enter the highway junction of Laval, 148 miles from Paris. battling rear guard Nazis across the river that cuts Laval in two. Rounding up more collaborationists. Isolating the port city of Saint Malo, where only 3,000 men of a defending Nazi force of 10,000 remain. Nazi prisoners who had been forced by their officers to take a written oath for a last ditch fight despite encirclement, lack of food and ammunition. 
In Normandy, at the eastern end of the crumbling German defenses, British advanced to within 2,000 yards of Villers Bocage, clearing heavily mined roads with Scorpion tanks. British artillery positions near Villers Bocage under Nazi counter battery fire. Entering Villers Bocage, 4th August. British armor continues to push back the enemy line southwest of Caen at La Bainie Bocage. Flame throwing Bren carriers attacking sniper nests beyond Villers Bocage. Germans incurred severe losses in the attempt to anchor their right flank at the Orn, while units disorganized by the U.S. breakthrough were withdrawn to new defensive positions. onay sur odon is captured 5th August. Germans withdrew from the town after being threatened by an armored division coming east from Veer and a column of troops pushing south from villers bocage Onay is completely wrecked. campaign to drive the Japs from northern Burma and complete a supply route to China continues despite high waters and waist-deep mud. Heavy monsoon rains washed out this bivouac area at strategically important Kamang in the Mogong Valley. Chinese artillery troops fighting under General Stilwell transport their vehicles to high ground employing a makeshift ferry. Cable, rope, oil drums and the ponton boat used in this operation are all part of captured Japanese materiel. Despite the floods, by August, Allied forces had overcome last resistance delaying completion of more than 160 miles of the Lido Road, which will be the first southern land link with China since the Japs cut the Burma Road. Mogong was attacked repeatedly before falling to the Allies. A railway bridge bombed by American aircraft while still in Japanese hands is speedily repaired. Sikhs of an Indian engineer's company handle the assignment. On the nearby mogong michinaw railroad line, also captured by the Allies, a brand new use is found for the Jeep. It pulls six light two-wheeled cars. By employing two jeeps placed back to back, one at each end of the train, trips can be made without switching. Personnel and supplies flown into a captured airstrip at Michinaw are transported along the 30-mile spur to Mogong, which has no airfield. Thus, Allied troops are provisioned for twin drives now threatening to crush the remaining Japs in northern Burma.
Men of a British brigade en route to Mogong pass knocked out enemy field pieces. Today, an all British division is operating in Burma, the first such unit to join the variety of contingents serving under General Stilwell. Flat cars make hour by hour circuits of the rail line. The tracks have been serviced by repair gangs of an American engineer's light Ponton company. They also act as drivers for the train. These troops participated in the fighting to expel the Japs from last strongholds at Michinaw. In a suicidal stand, the enemy held out against the Allies for 78 days before their organized resistance ended 3rd August. Even before final capture of Michinaw, Allied planes were able to use its important airstrip. P-40Ns conducted up to 44 sorties a day to help neutralize Jap pillboxes and bunkers that prolonged the siege in this area. positions were attacked within 100 yards of our forward elements. Once they dive-bombed the enemy a mere 20 yards from American positions. Japs brought a huge amount of abandoned equipment into Allied hands. A large part of it is put back to use by American Ordnance and Signal Corps men. During three months, ending 1st August, five Jap divisions comprising more than half the enemy's total in Burma were destroyed by General Stilwell's forces. This is part of the equipment left behind in the Kameng area. The Jap motor pool includes a 1941 Chevrolet. Also at Kamang, Chindits were evacuated from the jungle after months of active duty. Composed of specially trained Britishers, West Africans and Indian troops, they originally landed in Burma from U.S. gliders and planes early in 1944. Their job was to harass Jap communications, to hold roadblocks and river strong points. A mobile hospital unit cares for sick and wounded chindits. New clothes are issued before moving to rest camps. On the way to Kamang after several days in camp, the achievements of the Chindits include a total of enemy dead running into thousands. Before withdrawing from a single roadblock southwest of Mogong, they killed more than 700 Japs. At Sin Kai, Chinese troops demonstrate the results of training according to U.S. Army doctrine and under American instructors.
They are almost ready for field assignments. At the present time, their countrymen are locked in fierce battles with the Japs near the Burma border in an attempt to join other Allied columns pushing down the Lido Road. Chinese troops form an integral part of General Stilwell's army, whose gains have been the most important made by the Allies on the Asiatic continent. At Colombo, Ceylon, 31st July, General Stilwell arrives on his first extended trip away from the jungle fighting since last December, when he attended the Cairo conference. He's met by Brigadier General Frank Merrill. Candy, Ceylon, 10th August, following confirmation of General Stilwell's promotion to a full general. of carrier action off Saipan in the offensives against the Marianas Islands. decks during extensive attacks that softened up the Central Pacific targets for amphibious operations. Jap bombers attempt to knock out elements of our task force.
crippled plane returns to an american carrier